All right, if everyone could take their seats, we'd like to get started. Welcome to the Citizens for Vallejo School Board Forum. My name is Paul Norberg, and I'm the treasurer of Citizens for Vallejo. The Citizens for Vallejo Political Action Committee was established in 2010 by Vallejo residents who want to ensure that candidates and incumbents demonstrate leadership qualities that advance the city of Vallejo. Before we get started, please turn off your cell phones to avoid any interruption to the event. Also, if you would please hold your applause until the end to avoid any disruption and uh, boos are not acceptable. We are pleased to see that the following candidates are here this evening. Ruskell Kayung Young, Hazel Wilson, Tony Ibaldi, Shelley Bloffmiller, and Berkey Worrell. Also, we would like to note that John Lewis and Richard Porter withdrew from the race after the ballot information was printed. So you will see their names on the ballot when you receive it in the mail. We'd also like to thank the Myra Community Theater for graciously donating their facility for this evening's event, and to Mark Garman for providing the video and the audio production, and to Vallejo Community Access TV, they will be uh, publishing this event at a later date. Our moderator this evening is Karima Kara. She's a Vallejo resident and president of the Myra Community Theater. Myra comes from a family committed to public education and we're pleased to have her as our moderator this evening. The Myra Community Theater is an all-volunteer, 100% community-run activity center. Just four years from its 100th anniversary, the Myra provides affordable meeting and performance space for dozens of Vallejo groups, including Curtain Call for Kids, Verismo Opera, Step Up Music, Bluegrass and Jazz Jams, and much more. Also, to support the Myra, please plan to attend the Myra Gala on October 3rd, featuring music, dance, gourmet foods, and a silent auction. Today's forum will take about two hours, and we hope to have it ending at 9 p.m. The questions will be asked in the following categories, leadership and vision, fiscal, safety, and transparency. The candidates have drawn random numbers to determine the order of their responses. We haven't pre-selected who will get which question. No candidate has been given the questions in advance. If time permits, we will take questions from the audience. When you arrived, you were given an opportunity to write your questions on an index card, which CFV members will select to pose to candidates as time allows. Our timekeepers this evening are Carol Heppe and Pat Norberg. Pat will flash a yellow card if you hold it up when there's 15 seconds remaining and a red card when time is up. Now I'll turn it over to Karima to get the forum started. Okay. So I'm really bad with a microphone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, just a little word. Um, first of all, I know you're not supposed to clap until the end, but I really think one, you should be clapping for the five that have enough gumption to put their name on a ballot and for you to come. It's wonderful to see all of you. So a round of applause, please. Cards? Oh, there are question cards and you will get them. Oh, you will get were, them. They were uh, at the front. Okay. As came in. You we'll, make sure, we'll make sure you get one. Totally. Okay. Okay. Promise. <laughs> um, the way it's, it's going to be worked tonight is they'll introduce themselves only, they'll answer questions, um, and at the end, uh, if there's time, there'll be questions from the audience. Um, but the Myra is never closed for a good deed or a good reason. And if the candidates are willing to stay on and maybe introduce themselves privately, they're most welcome and we'll keep the doors open. So don't feel like your voice isn't heard here, okay? 
Yes, Anne? Oh, microphone. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Let's start. Okay. Okay, the first question is to Mr. Russell Kayang Yang. Could you m repeat your name? And, and I will read the question after that. Rusko Kayang Yang. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kayang Yang, what do you think your role as a school board member would be, and how did you determine that? The job of a school board member um, is to set and develop policies for the school district, represent the community when decisions are made, advocate and protect the district, and also um, hold office hours with the community. Having served on a college board, it has prepared me to um, prepare me for, for this position because I because I've been there. I've I've worked with fellow board members, community, and staff to develop policies in, in the best interest of the institution, and and it has been very helpful. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Wilson, you have a minute to. To answer the question, would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Okay. What do you think your role as a school board member is, and how did you determine that role? My role as a school board member is to set district policies that's in the best interest of students, children, to follow the law, the school board members, we have one employee, and that is the superintendent. It, we are responsible for following all laws to be transparent, to ensure that we protect the fiscal assets of the district. I determined my role by my work as serving on the board for 13 years and attending California School Board Association meetings, participating in conferences, and listening to teachers, community, and all of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Yobaldi, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Please okay. do. What do you think your role as a school board member is, and how did you determine that role? Thank you. Appreciate the question. I also appreciate the opportunity to be before the Vallejo citizen. My role as a school board member is established by the education code, and that is basically policy making. We have one employee, and that is the superintendent, which we supervise. The governance entails physical. It entails the whole community. It entails fiduciary responsibility for caring for the whole, the whole district. My role is one of, and which came from me, is the supporter, to be supportive of the, co the total community. The students, number one, the classroom, secondly. And lastly, being for those who are th th those who are the lowest and deprived. That is a personal choice on my part. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Question number two goes to Ms. Lonk Miller. Um, you have a minute and a half to answer the question. And the question is, as a school board member, what is your responsibility to teachers? What, if anything, would you gain by attending school employee union meetings? As a member of the governing board, I feel like our responsibility to the teachers is to first and foremost listen to their concerns take to heart what they're bringing to us as concerns, and also offer them the opportunity to bring their ideas for corrective action, for um, 
implementing possibly new programs, just being the eyes and ears of the community on their behalf, but also recognizing that as employees, their reporting function is to the superintendent and the administration. To respond to union concerns will take a lot of care and thoughtfulness. You cannot discount what the community has to say, and as members of our community, our teachers have a lot at stake and a lot going on in the classroom that we need to be able to answer for. If they have concerns, we really do need to listen with our whole heart and an open mind, also understanding that their agendas may be a little bit different than what policy we can provide. Thank you. Mr. Worrell, um, would you have one minute to answer the question. Would you like me to repeat it? No, you're okay? Nope. You're wonderful. Uh, my role as a school board member is to listen to everyone, which does include the employees, which includes the teachers. Uh, I would have no problem going to meetings. I did it in the past. I served on the, on the board for eight years. Uh, I have been to uh, the union meetings of all the employees. Uh, I was probably the first school board member that actually sat in and listened to the negotiations that were going on. So I would know exactly what was being said on both sides. I didn't have to worry about giving, having the administration give me their point of view, what was going on, or from the employees, their part. I went in and actually sat and listened to what was going on during the negotiations. A school board member needs to know everything that's going on as much as possible. That means not only listening, but hearing what is being said. Thank you. Mr. Kayang Yang, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Okay. As a school board member, what is your responsibility to teachers? What, if anything, would you gain by attending school employee union meetings? My responsibility to the teachers of the school district is to at least be the eyes and ears of what's going on in the classrooms, visit the classrooms, ask how's, how's it going, and also ask the students how's everything going. And whenever there's an issue going on in the classroom, I would bring it up at the, at the next school board meeting and, and get the support of the board that this issue must be addressed, whether it's bullying or safety. I would also advocate as a, as a board member to have the, the teacher union and, the, and classified student classified and student representatives at the dais and, and give them, have them give input about what's going on in the district and decisions that come before the board. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, you get the third question. You have a minute and a half to answer. And the question is, Last year's high school graduation rate was reported to be approximately 65%. Why do you think it's low? What would you do or what are you doing to improve the graduation rates now? Thank you for the question. What we are doing to improve our graduation rate is uh, we're, we have implemented wall-to-wall -wall academies, including biotechnology, biomedicine, engineering, health and physical fitness, and 11, a total of 11 career academies. We have also, we have academic support providers at each of our campuses. That means that they, these, individuals identify students early on that need assistance, we make sure that we immediately identify students who need credit recovery and immediately place them in support services. Our full service community schools support the total child, whether they need mental health, support, drug rehabilitation, whether they need academic support, whether they need food, 
We serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner to support our students. Health services are provided on our campuses. Our full service school concept and our academic support Thank you. programs Thank you. are provided to increase the graduation rate. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Ubaldi, you are number two. Thank you. You have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Please do. Last year's high school graduation rate was reported to be approximately 65%. Why do you think this is low? What would you do and what are you doing to improve the graduation rate? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the question. When I came on board, it was 50%. Two years before, year after that was 65, and the third year it's going to be higher. We are doing everything we can to impact the graduation through the wall-to-wall -wall academies. Trustee Wilson talked about various academies. I'd like to add to that biomedical, Green Academy, International Finance, Multimedia, Law Academy, and Culinary Arts. Our focus is two prongs, academic and career. And the fact that we're able to balance and concentrate and focus on the needs of the students, they are able to stay because we're not just saying this is the only path to go, but we're looking at their particular needs, their interests, and it is working. The full service community is another tool that we're using Thank that you. truly embrace the kids, the focus of the needs of the kids. Thank you. Ms. Longmiller, you have the final response to this question. Would you like me to repeat the question? Okay. I fully support all the programs that have, been that have started in our district, and I do see the fruit that they are bearing um, with the increase um, in the graduation rate in the last few years. Obviously, it's still not enough. What I believe we should be doing as well is supporting the teachers, of giving them more prep time, providing exceptional professional development programs so that they have the skills necessary to first identify the students that are struggling, and secondly, to answer the, the needs of those students on a very individual basis. Knowing that we've got so many challenges in the schools with our students, being able to identify and then provide the support for the teacher and the student hand in hand, I think is very, very important. Thank you. Mr. Worrell, you get the fourth question. You have a minute and a half to answer. And the question is, would you change the current class size? And if so, why and how? To change the current class size, you would need to uh, work with a contract with the teachers. You would also need more money. Because the state has cut the uh, funding to the schools, that's the main reason why class sizes have gone up. We used to have a smaller class size, but because of the lack of funds, it's the biggest reason why we cannot uh, afford smaller class sizes. So we need to work with our legislators so we can get more monies coming into the schools so that we can then lower our class size back down to what it used to be. Thank you. Mr. Kayanyang, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat that question? Yes, please. Would you change current class sizes? If so, why and how? If I remember as a student, um, sitting in one of our high, especially at Vallejo High School, our class sizes was at least almost 30, if not 32. That's too many kids for one teacher and enough individual attention that our kids get and they, and they must get individual attention. As your school board member, I would advocate for reducing the class size to at least one teacher per 20. Um, how we're gonna do that, um, I'm gonna also, um, find a way to improve teacher morale such as advocating for um, increase in their starting pay. Our, our teachers in this district are the lowest paid in the county. 
and I'll find ways in our budget to do that. I'm going to advocate for lower class sizes and improving teacher morale. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Please. Would you change current class size? And if so, why and how? Our district has a 3.5% reserve currently. We are required to have a 3% reserve. We have sound accounting practices and strong internal control. We have a balanced budget and we have a positive certification that says that we can meet our current financial obligations and the two years out. Therefore, to maintain our sound physical status, we must make sure that we would have funds available to recruit to reduce our class sizes. Currently, we do not have that. Although we have reduced classes to 27 to 1 in many cases, but it would be irresponsible just to talk about recruit, reducing class size. Thank you. Thank you. Without having physical accountability. Mr. Ubaldi, your question is number five. You have a minute and a half. What are your top three priorities you would like to see the school district implement? The first one is the classroom. It's always been my particular interest. I am deeply concerned about the amount of money that we're paying our classroom teachers. We are not competitive at all. Our, our teachers are leaving us because their other school districts are way higher. So that's one immediate top priority. The other thing that comes to my mind immediately is the, the program the needs that we need to, to cooperate. I had, a, I had a visit one time with a labor leader saying our apprenticeship is leaving us because many of them are not sure about what they want to do. So what I said to them is that why don't we create another wall-to-wall -wall academy where we can have seniors beginning, especially in the area of technology, marketing, and training so that at senior year, they can start getting those particular training, and the second year, we will pass them on either to the corporate community or the labor community for their apprenticeship. And I think the high school kids in particular is a very powerful place to begin them and teach them and help them understand their, their particular interests. And the last one is to maintain the fiscal stability of our, of our school system. We have been very blessed that we have three and a half percent in our kitty, and we only need three percent. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Long Miller, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat that? Thank you. It all starts in the classroom with supporting our teachers. So in order to attract and retain the best, we have to have, um, we've got to offer them the pay structure that will allow them to live here. Allowing them to continue to bleed out of our district into surrounding areas is, we just can't do that. We have to find a way to make pay equity a priority. Knowing that we're in a very tender fiscal situation, that will take a lot of balancing and it'll take a lot of cooperation from everybody on all sides of the issue. That's first and foremost. We can't have empty teachers or empty classrooms. Secondly, we need to address the safety concerns of our teachers and our students. Whether it's perceived or reported through the grand jury and actual instances of violence are occurring, we need to, we need to address those head on. We cannot say it's not happening. We need to go in and fully investigate and Thank address you. it. Thank you. Mr. Worrell, would you like me to repeat the question? Okay, one minute, please. Uh, my first priority would be uh, to try and lower class size, as I stated before, but to do that, we all need to work with our legislators because the legislators are the ones that will give us the money so we can afford to lower our class size. 
The second one is we retain our teachers. We have got some great programs that have come to this district, but if we don't retain our teachers, they are not going to work. A stable workforce is needed if we are going to continue to improve and make these new programs work. Uh, the last thing would be to hear the community, and one of the things the community is extremely worried about is the safety. We can all sit here and say uh, it's not safe or it is safe, but until we listen to the community, which is our parents, they know what's going on at the schools. If I go out there, it doesn't mean just because I don't see anything, nothing's going on. We need to hear what our community is saying to us. Thank you. Mr. Kayang Yang, you have question number six. You have a minute and a half. And the question is, what policies would you implement to encourage high morale among all school district employees? When I was serving on the college board, uh, usually, in April, usually in March or April, we usually have an end of the year recognition for our, our faculty and staff that has been with the college for many years. As, a, as, a, as your board member, I would um, institute such an initiative that we recognize all employees with their years of service in, in the school district, in the, usually in the spring. At least it goes a long way towards improving morale. In addition, advocate for higher wages for our, our employees within the fiscal constraint of our budget. Currently, um, our school district has almost twice the state average of school administrators, and that's the funding I would go for to cut and then redirect the funding towards improving wages for teachers and staff members. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, you have a minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Okay. What policies would you implement to encourage high morale among all school district employees? I believe it's important to listen to, the, to our employees. I believe that we, as we already have in place, we should have surveys, we should have celebrations, and we should continue to work toward getting them equitable pay with which we're doing within the constraints of our budgets. I also believe that for employees who are not in the classroom, that when you don't have the money, there are alternatives, and that's alternate work plans, alternate work schedules, that still provide service to our communities, but also gives the employees an opportunity to have an alternate work day to support their families, to attend activities, and to be a part of, take care of medical needs, et cetera. That's how I would support Thank you. the Thank you. employees. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ubaldo, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? I have it. Okay. Thank you. Good policy has to be done, not in isolation, but in collaborative partnership with the total community. That is what good policy is. Can't do it on your own. My role as a trustee is one of listening and opening doors. We need to address the classroom, in particular, the needs of the students, support of the parents and the classroom teacher. Lastly, being present and available. The last three years, or two years and nine months, I have been very present and available, not only to the district office, but in the classrooms to visit the schools, and you will find me there regularly, because I want to listen and hear specifically the concern of the total community. Thank you. Thank you. Question number seven goes to you, Ms. Lochmiller, and you have a minute and a half to answer. What would you do to stop staff and teachers from leaving the district? Sometimes a pat on the back and a sincere thank you 
look you in the eye and say, I really appreciate the work you're doing, can go an enormous amount for taking that teacher that may be struggling and thinking, I'm about to leave because I haven't had, had a thank you in years. I'm not being paid enough. The kids are throwing chairs whatever those things are that are going on in the classroom that makes it untenable for them to stay. Pay is one thing, but actually showing sincere gratitude and offering whatever assistance you can have, if it's recruiting more parents that can come and volunteer in the classroom. Just those day-to-day those -day interactions that you have with an individual and respect them for the job they're doing. They've got one of the most tough jobs in the world. It's as tough as being a parent at times. That would go a long ways. It's not the ultimate answer. Being responsive when they put in a work order, finding the, the supplies that they need if they're running short of something, activating the PTA groups, and recruiting more individuals outside the community, building strong partnerships. We've gone a long ways to build strong partnerships within the community, but there's still more work that we can do. Again, gratitude sincere, heartfelt, face-to-face, -face, and just be present. Listen to what they're telling us. Thank you. Mr. Wall, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat it? Uh, no, thank you. I'll tell you the first thing I wouldn't do is I wouldn't tell the employees, if you don't like it here, I'll help you pack your box and you can leave. To me, <laughs> to me that's not supporting the employees, and that is what our job is to do is to uh, support our employees. We need to not only listen, but we need to hear what they say. There is nothing wrong with bringing the employees in and being part of this solution. Without our employees, none of our good programs are going to work. If we keep having a revolving door, then the, the programs will eventually uh, not work. We don't have the money to pay as high as some of the other districts do around here. But if we support them, we listen to them, and treat them with the dignity and respect that we all want, they will be more likely to stay here than go someplace else. Thank you. Mr. Kayanyan, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. What would you do to stop staff and teachers from leaving the district? We'll first advocate for higher wages with, within the constraints of our budget. Next. Also, um, I, I just talked to a teacher this past summer, and they, had to, and they spent hundreds of dollars on school supplies out of their own pocket. I would advocate for cuts in, in administration and redirect the funding to fund school supplies at the school sites. That should not be coming out of a teacher's pocket. That should be for the students and the classroom. In addition, to take it even further, I'm going to, as a board member, and I've done this before, hold office hours on various school site campuses. I, I, I wouldn't mind holding office hours with the students and the, and the teachers on that campus and hear what they, what they need to be done and advocate for them and stand up for them at the next board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, your question is question number eight. You have a minute and a half. And the question is, if the situation would arise, how would you and how do you express your disagreement with the superintendent? Please. Thank you. The, situa the situation does arise. I have no problem speaking my mind, none whatsoever. I've done it throughout my 13 years on the board, and when I need to, I have a record of, if needed, to remove superintendents. I see no need in this particular situation. I believe that Dr. Bishop has brought great programs to our district. This particular forum, they talked about bringing a district from mediocre 
to high achieving. The programs that have been brought to this district has got us there. But it seems to be the elephant in the room We understand it. This is not about how well our school district is doing. And our school district is moving forward. The state, the state superintendent recognizes it. Thank we're you. noted throughout the state for the work that we're doing. Thank you. Excuse me, can we keep the clapping down only because we've got a long Excuse list. me, it's amazing to me. Ms. Wilson, that Ms. Wilson, Ms. Wilson, thank you. Okay, everybody, thank you, Ms. Wilson. Now, number, Mr. Ubaldi, you have one minute. I'll wait for silence. You have one minute. Would you like me to read the question? I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay. If the situation would arise, how would you, how do you express your disagreement with the superintendent? I have, as a president of the board, I hear a lot of things. And we have had disagreements. My style, and I think the style of most of my, my colleagues, is one is being able to talk to her one on one if it's really, really serious. One on one and talk it through and actually, actually report particular incidents and reports, reporting that we get regularly. And the last one, which is probably the most important one, is our evaluation. We meet four times a year, quarterly, to evaluate our superintendent. And all my colleagues have particular input because they, we are very diverse as the trustees. We hear a lot, of, a lot of things from our particular communities and people that we work with. So those are the tools that we use, one-on-one, -on -one, Evaluation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Ms. Longmiller, you have one minute. Would you like me to read the question again? Okay. With over 24 years of HR experience, I have no problem addressing issues with an employee. If it's just a simple disagreement, that's one thing. But if it's affecting morale, if it's affecting our fiscal responsibility, that's quite another matter. That's very serious. Sitting down across the table from an employee to put together a corrective action plan is part and parcel of that responsibility. If we do it in conjunction with the rest of the board, four times a year to evaluate, I have to ask, where's the improvement that you're seeing and what is next? So always looking forward, correcting what's deficient, praising what's working well, being fair and balanced in that conversation with any employee is utmost important. Legally, we have to do that. If there's a grievance that needs to be heard, I have no problem getting in somebody's face, but in a very professional and direct way. Thank you. Mr. Worrell, question number nine goes to you. You have a minute and a half, and the question is, consider this scenario. The district is conducting a mid-year budget review, and it is determined that reviews, revenues have fallen below expectations. And the district must now make budget cuts. In this situation, what is the first thing you would cut and why? Well, the first thing I would do, I wouldn't cut, I would go back over the budget and if need to, go line by line item, which I did before when I was on the school board, and see what can be cut uh, furthest from the classroom. Uh, to sit here and say specifically what I would cut, I, I cannot do that. Uh, I would have to study the budget, see where 
I would determine there is some surplus and where we could cut back on it. Uh, but I can't sit up here now and say to you anything specifically that I could cut from the budget without going over the specific budget. Thank you. Mr. Kayang Yang, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Consider this scenario. The district is conducting a mid-year budget review and it is determined and it is determined that revenues have fallen below expectations and the district must now make budget cuts. In this situation, what is the first thing you would cut and why? I've been in that situation before when I first got appointed to the college board and the first thing I advocated was not renewing administrative contracts since we had almost an exorbitant number of administrators at our institution. And the first thing I would cut is administration. According to the California State Department of Education and Education Data, we have almost twice that number of administrators in this district compared to neighboring districts. We need to bring it down and redirect the funds to the classroom. That's the first thing I would cut is administration. Next thing is I would cut allowances such as cell phone allowances, travel, travel allowances to conferences, and, and runaway spending. That's, that's, that's not how you um, lead by example. That those, we need to make sure the classrooms are protected, the teachers are protected, the students are protected. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, Please. you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Please. Okay. Consider this scenario. The district is conducting a mid-year budget review and it is, determ it is determined that revenues have fallen below expectations and the district must now make budget cuts. In this situation, what is the first thing you would cut and why? I would look to cut. I would look to increase revenue. I would make sure that we were doing everything possible to ensure that our ADA was continued at the same level or increasing. I would look also to the reserve. We have a three and a half percent. We're only required to have three percent. So l that's why we have the three and a half percent. Look to the f uh, five percent excess and use that rather than making cuts. Any cuts I would make, I would make it farther from the classroom. I'd look at uh, the budget uh, line by line, but I would look to revenue first. And the revenue would be ADA, and the 5% reserve. The reason you have the additional 5% rather than spending everything that you have is for this particular purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ubaldi, the next question, question number 10 goes to you. You have a minute and a half. And the question is, what, what criteria would you, do you, used to evaluate how the school district superintendent is performing. The policy that, uh, or practice that we have used as a board is that develop particular areas of concerns, interest, to look at the full picture of the needs of the school district. And we divide that among ourselves in order to fully understand the successes and the weaknesses of our district superintendent. So it is a, a, a team and collaborate effort on the part of the, the trustees because the responsibility of ev evaluation lies only in the hands of the board member. So we divide the responsibilities and we do our due diligence and do the best we can. And, and a lot of that is listening, a lot of that is observing, a lot of that is visiting, and a lot of that is talking among ourselves, all in a closed session. That's how we do our, our determining the criteria in determining how successful and how we can help our superintendent to become the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Long Miller, would you like me to repeat the question? You have one minute. Thank you. 
In my corporate experience, we went through what we called a 360 degree review process where peers, subordinates, and superiors did the evaluation. And the employee also does the evaluation on themselves. And what we found was the employee was generally much harder on themselves than we would ever have thought possible. So I would implement something like that. Um, we, sat, we found the rate of improvement really increased. Once we were able to see what the employee felt like they were deficient in and offering them the support necessary to improve their performance, but also not relegating full responsibility, obviously sitting down with the other board members and taking a look at all the responsibilities of, of the CEO position that a superintendent has for fiscal management, for HR management, for facility responsibilities and such. The 360 degree process is extremely painful the first time you go through it, but after you go through it and you survive, Thank your, you. your performance is it's just Thank amazing you. what happens. Thank you. Mr. Roll, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Uh, I would evaluate the uh, superintendent on several things. The first and foremost would be, is the district financially solvent? Or is the board being given the correct information? Uh, the second one would be our student achievement. It is one of the responsibilities for the superintendent to make sure the right programs are being taught in the school and that they are being taught properly. Uh, the next one would be on community involvement. Any superintendent, just like any city manager, needs to be involved in the community. That means going to different functions so you can listen to the community. And that doesn't mean just school functions. Everybody here, most of us here, may not have children in the school. So we need some way to connect with the superintendent, and that is by the superintendent getting out and going to different events. And the last thing would be employee morale. If you don't have good employee morale, that is the responsibility, first and foremost, of the superintendent, and secondly, of the board, if they know that the employee morale is not well. Thank you. Mr. Kayangyang, you have question number 11. You have a minute and a half to answer. And the question is, the grand jury reported that in Solano County, Vallejo City Unified School District has the highest salaried administrators and the lowest paid teachers. Would you support reducing administrative salaries in order to increase teacher pay? Why or why not? Yes, I would, re I would support um, advocating cuts at administration, where it's salary or positions, because our, our number one goal as a school district is, is teaching the kids and preparing them for success after they graduate. That's number one, not hiring more administrators or, or the such. We, if you look at, look at the data out there, whether it's the part of education or data quest or ed, or ed data, um, this is all online. We have almost twice the amount of administrators as, as compared to number, neighboring school districts. And as a board member, when, when we do the budget review in the beginning of the year, I'm going to advocate for we have to cut administrative positions that are not essential to the learning of these kids. That's number one. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Okay. The grand jury reported that in Solano County, Vallejo City Unified School District has the highest salaried administrators and the lowest paid teachers. Would you support reducing administrative salaries in order to increase teacher pay? Why or why not? As we all know, the grand jury just as they did with the county supervisors, they presented information that is questionable. For number one, we just have had administrators leave our district, one in particular who got $20,000 more to go to the Fairfield district as a principal. 
So that does, there's something wrong with the picture when you say that the grand jury made that report. Our superintendent makes about thirty or forty thousand dollars less than the one in Fairfield. So um, I would need to have the records in front of me. When the county board was presented their grand jury report, they found that it was riddled with errors, especially in the area of finances. So I would need the records in front of me Thank to you. make that count to answer that particular Thank question. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Ubaldi, may I repeat the question? You have one minute. No, you, you You're don't okay? need to do that. Okay. I am, I am just overwhelmed with that observation or that report. I don't know of such report. The highest paid. Do you know we tried to raise her salary and she refused, refused because of the high achievement that she has done for the school district. She has invitation to go to other districts. And so we are trying to be supportive of her. And to say, and I, I agree with uh, Ms. Wilson, the fact that one of our principals had $20,000 more, but as a principal. So I'm, I'm just bewildered by that, by, by that question. I don't agree with that. If it's true though, I will focus on the needs of the classroom and the teachers in particular to raise their income. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have two announcements to make. There are two cars in the parking lot with lights left on. One is a Saturn with license 4GEL923. And the other one is a Toyota license 0806Y and disabled plates. Thank you. Okay, take a deep breath, everybody. Let's start again. Ha, huh. question number 12 goes to you, Ms. Longmiller, and you have a minute and a half, and the question is, do you support the school bond that will be on the November ballot? Why or why not? If yes, what measures would you implement to assure it is spent in a manner in which it is intended? Yes, I do support the Major E bond. Um, frankly, our, our students deserve and our teachers deserve to work in facilities that are modernized, safe, and secure. It's been 17 years since we've gone to the public for more funds. I know it's a long time. We're patching things together as, it's, as it stands. Ultimately, it's up to the public to decide whether or not we're going to support the schools with that kind of funding. It's a huge ask, and I appreciate how big that is for a lot of folks to sacrifice. However, with the proper oversight and a publicly appointed oversight committee that our community can agree on, so that we're certain that the funding is spent as it's prescribed in the bond measure, we have to have that level of, of oversight in order for it to be even considered by the public. Beyond that, there is a plan in place to to do the upgrades and the improvements, it will just take a lot longer and our kids will not have the technology upgrades that other kids in other districts have. I visited other districts. I've been in our sites as well. The difference is rather astounding. I would offer that any of the public go out and, and take a look what the kids are, are working with, what our teachers are working with. We can do better. Can we afford to do it now? or do it later. That's your choice. I'm on the committee. I want to help get this passed, but I'm also prepared to deal with the Thank outcome you. if we don't pass it. Thank you. Mr. Worrell, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the only way we're going to get our schools fixed is by a bond measure. The state no longer supports to the level that they used to. When we passed Measure A, there was a lot of matching funds. However, uh, it was brought up last night about an oversight committee. 
The real oversight committee is the board. And last night at the school board meeting, under their uh, purchase orders, there were several things where major A money was being spent, which I questioned. One of the things was they were using major A money to pay for moving the Vallejo Charter School to its new location. That was not ever intended for major A money. The board put all that on hold, the seven different items, and they're gonna look at it, which they need to do. But it is the responsibility of the board to look over all these items when they come before them and make sure they judge them and know that they are going for the proper use. You can have a bond implementation committee, we had it for Measure A, and all that is is a buffer zone. It's still the responsibility of every board member to look over the items as they're being spent. Thank you. Okay, we have question number 13. And we're changing the rhythm a little bit. And the question goes to Ms. Hazel Wilson. So we're gonna continue this way. You'll, we'll come back to you, definitely. You won't be missed. Um, you have a minute and a half, Ms. Wilson. I'm sorry. Mr. Kayang-Yang, you didn't answer the question, did you? Yes, and I would love to answer the question. Oh, of course. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Of course Ms. Meisner wouldn't have made a mistake. This is, measure, <laughs> this, this is regarding Measure E. Yes, bond. it is. May I? Uh, do you want me to repeat the question? Um, I'm good, thank you. And thank you very much. Oh, I'm glad everything's okay. Continue. I would only support Measure E, the almost quarter of a billion dollar school bond with new school board members that would advocate for stronger transparency and accountability of the money, making, ensuring that the monies do get, do get to the classrooms and to the school sites, not to administration. Even with the promises of audits and oversight committee, and I, and I do support an independent appointed oversight committee, not from the board, but outside governing boards like the County Board of Education, Public confidence is so fragile right now, we need new board members to oversee the money. Once we get, once new board members are elected, then they can work hard to rebuild the public confidence and hopefully um, we'll see our schools improve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, no rhythm change. <laughs> you get question number 13, Ms. Wilson. And the question is, you have an, a minute and a half. What should be done to assure you are receiving accurate and credible reports from the district, particularly as it relates to finance and implementation and progress of the new full service community school program. I take nothing in a report as accurate, including the grand jury report. I investigate, I worked for IRS for 38 years, a large corporate audit manager. So a report to me is something that you investigate. How I know, I am at the school sites. I'm at Vallejo High School every day since it was the bed ground of the grand jury report. How do I know? I'm at my four grandsons elementary school. And because I know what the full service community school program elements are, it's not just a concept to me, I've studied it. I'm at the school sites on a regular basis. I'm talking to the teachers, talking to the students, talking to the parents, talking to the administrators, making sure that's what is asked for, what is required, what the full service community schools offer is being given to our schools. And we see that in the results, decreased dropout rate, 
increased graduation rate. Thank you. That's how I know. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Ubaldi, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Please do. What should be done to assure you are receiving accurate and credible reports from the district, particularly as it relates to finances and implementation and progress of the new full service community school program? Thank you so much. We have created an audit citizens audit committee. This was not present until a year ago. And these are independent citizens with particular professional background, accountants in particular, to look at our budget and determine the fiscal stability. And they are the ones who are supposed to, they're only responsible for the board. And they are there to inform us if we are cons consistent with the budget that we have approved. Secondly, in regards to the full service community, you have to be present, you have to attend, you have to participate. And always listening, listening to your people that you work with, in particular the classroom teachers, the staff, the parents, Thank and you. even the students Thank themselves. You. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Longmiller, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Okay, thank you. I'm a trust and verify type personality, a little bit of a control freak. Um, and I think that's a good thing. When you're looking at budgets, comparison, comparing to like size districts with like size issues would be one measurement. Also lowering our tolerance for variance. So let's say, plus or minus 3% goes in any kind of a political poll, lowering that level before it catches our attention to say 1%. If we're off by a certain amount of variance, then we need to be looking at that line or that department or those outcomes. I'm with the rest of the crowd here. We have to be present on the sites and make sure that our students are receiving the types of services in the programs that they're promised that they're prescribed in the paperwork that is describing to us what these programs are all about. We'll see it in the outcomes, but we need to have consistent checkpoints along the way so that we're not so far into the weeds before we recognize that there's an issue. Thank you. Mr. Worrell, you get question number 14. You get a minute and a half. And the question is, the most recent audit available is for fiscal year 2011. Have you read this audit report and the 27 recommendations for improvement or noncompliance? What steps would you take to improve timely financial reporting, and implementation of audit recommendations. In 2011, we were still under the state administrator's uh, purview. I was a person who was in charge completely of the finances back in 2011. No, I have not read that particular audit. Uh, what you need to do, though, as a school board member, is go over the recommendations with your auditor, because we do have our own auditor now that's independent, that works just for the board. Uh, you also still have a state administrator that oversees what we do. The state can still, when they review the budget, if they find anything wrong with it, they can make the changes uh, or tell the school board they need to make the changes and they will have to be made. Otherwise, we'll go back under uh, the purview of the state administrator. So there are already checks and balances. The county has to come down now and uh, give their report on our uh, budget. It used to be that the, and we all know, that the county used to just send a letter. Uh, that didn't work because that got waylaid. So now 
uh, the county has to physically come down every year to give a report to the board on our on our budget. Thank you. Mr. Kayanyan, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Okay. The most recent audit available is for fiscal year 2011. Have you read this audit report and the 27 recommendations for improvement or non-compliance? What steps would you take to improve timely financial reporting and implementation of audit recommendations? Having served on a college board audit committee, whenever uh, we usually meet with our auditors uh, twice a year, get reports of what were in compliant, not in compliant, and they gave us recommendations. And, and I wholeheartedly support implementing those recommendations. I even asked for follow-up progress on those recommendations, already implementing them. That's the kind of leadership I'll bring as your school board member. It's unfortunate that um, you, have to, you have to like find the audit report on the school district website. It's, it's like hidden within five pages of information. Um, we got to improve transparency by, by having the audit report on the front page of our website. And at every board meeting, I'm going to ask about, are we making progress? Are we in, in compliance? If not, then we got to be in compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson? We have a, a qualified <laughs> certification on our audit. If you understand the different certifications that can be given, a qualified certification is a good certification. I attend both the opening and the closing of every audit. I am able, when we're doing the interim meetings, to make suggestions to the auditor and to the district. In one particular meeting recently, the auditor was making a recommendation that would have cost the district over a million dollars. I was able to, through my knowledge and understanding of the audit process, to turn that down to $6,000. Yes, we have a state trustee, and may I correct, we're talking Thank about you. the audit of the financial Thank statements, you, not the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ubaldi, question number 15, you have a minute and a half. Let's give the audience a moment to relax. Okay. Mr. Ubaldi, you have question number 15. You have a minute and a half. And the question is, what are your expectations for administrators and board members to do regular school site visits? My expectations is being done. All our administrators are required to be present. And they have responsibility for oversight and also support, not only oversight, but support of the local administrators. The board of trustees are doing the same thing, not oversight, but support in any way they can to listen, to offer encouragement, and to raise the morale as possible. You know, one of, one of the specific things I do when I go to local, sco local uh, uh, school, I go to find the janitor, and I go there and thank him and praise him for the work that he's done to keep our school safe and healthy. So it is, we are doing this, and, and there is definite responsibilities and accountability assigned by the superintendent in making sure that the schools are being visited by the administrators because you have a hierarchy, you know, organization, and they have to be responsible for oversight and support of the classrooms and the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Long Miller, would you like me to repeat the question? You have one minute. 
The expectation of our board to be on the school site should be a no-brainer. I would think as a retired person, um, I have the time. That's part of the reason I threw my hat in the ring for this race is I have the time to be on the sites talking with the kids and the parents, the teachers, um, weekly, bi-weekly, if it's a rotation through the board so that we're visiting different sites so that we're all seeing different things because we look at different things. Um, that would be a minimum, a minimum expectation. If the only time that we're out and about on those sites is when it suits our schedules, then something's wrong. We need a level of commitment from our board to be more present and listening. The expectation or what you can be accomplished on the site is, is basically just listen. You can't make recommendations on the ground, that's up for, that's the staff's positions but being there on a regular basis, both announced and unannounced, I think is, is a reasonable expectation. Thank you. Mr. Worrell, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my expectation is uh, the administrator as much as possible within the time limit for the superintendent to make sure that that person visits the school sites as often as they can. Uh, I also expect the superintendent to have people who do that as part of their job. For the board to visit the school sites, what we used to have at one time on the, in the school board was we split the different school sites up because it is impossible for any one board member to go to every single school site. So what we did, and I would like to see done again, is you divide the school district, the school sites up, and it's a responsibility of certain board members to make sure that they go and see periodically what's going on at those school sites, uh, encourage them to do better, and to come back and to report to the rest of the board members what they see going on at the school sites, both good and bad. Thank you. Mr. Kayan Young, you have question number 16. You have a minute and a half. And the question is, there is an initiative in the school district to reduce the number of expulsions. How would you measure the effectiveness of this as it relates to ensuring school safety? That's a really great question. <laughs> I don't have a, um, although I don't have a silver bullet answer to uh, address school safety uh, fully, uh, what I can do as a board member is meet with the police chief, get his ideas of how we can improve school safety, um, advocate for school research personnel and more counselors on campus to be there for the students, and finally advocate for fresh ideas that uh, citizens uh, brought this to my attention, ethnic studies. Research has shown, especially at Tucson Unified School District and, and reports from the National Education Association, that it can dramatically, when fully implemented, dramatically reduce disruption, suspensions, and expulsions exponentially. That's amazing. And it needs to be fully implemented in, this, in the school district. Since we're serving the most diverse student population probably in the country, I would advocate for full implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Please. Okay. There is an initiative in the school district to reduce the number of expulsions. How would you measure the effectiveness of this as it relates to ensuring school safety? School expulsions are governed by Ed Code. There are certain criteria for expulsions. We must follow the law. And in doing so, we must ensure that we are not creating any type of disparity. And certainly the idea of eth ethics studies is a great idea. In fact, we're doing that right now. We have a lesson, we have lesson plans. This is week 10's lesson plan that I've opened to. It's taught throughout the school district at appropriate grade levels with appropriate information for each of our students. 
That is part of our positive behavior intervention and support system. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ubaldi, you have one minute. Would you like me to read the question again? There is an initiative in the school district to reduce the number of expulsions. How would you measure the effectiveness of this as it relates to ensuring school safety? How does one measure the effectiveness of this initiative? By the numbers of our students who are graduating. We have increased our graduation rate from 50% when I entered to 65 years after that. And we still have one year that have not been reported officially. I know what the numbers is, are. I know that it's gonna be higher than 65. That's one measurement. But we also need to sustain the positive school cultures that we have established in a school district. There are three tiers of support to our students. The positive behavior intervention, PBIS, that uh, Trustee Wilson said, restorative justice, making our students whole once again, helping them to become whole. And the last one is the positive ju justice initiative. Those are the Thank three you. tiers of support. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Ms. Lochmiller, you have question number 17. You have a minute and a half. And the question is, it's been reported that the school district is considering bringing back police officer to Vallejo's two high school campuses. What policies would you develop to assure a positive relationship between these officers and the students. First and foremost, I'm very happy to hear that uh, development. Um, I think the more adult that we have on campus that may not have teaching responsibilities, but have eyes for the other things that occur you know, on the community of the campus is very, very important. Setting policy for how they're chosen is our first step. Making sure that they're the right individual for the needs of the kids and have the emotional strength to support the kids and develop those strong relationships so that we can repair and not inflame. They need to be leaders of their own um, community. They also need to be able to really respond to the kids, meet the kids where they're at. So the choice of who these folks are going to be on the sites, extremely important. I would base some of those decisions on other districts where it's working well. We've had them in the past, and we've taken them away. But to const be we have to remain vigilant that once those officers are on site, that they're performing to our expectations, and that they are developing those relationships with the kids, because that's where it's going to make the biggest difference. It's not a cookie cutter approach, but it's something that I feel like we really need to take serious. Take it very seriously and make the right choices of the right people, and now's the right time. Thank you. Mr. Worrell, would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'm extremely happy to hear that it's in the works to bring back the school resource officers. I've been asking the board to do this for several years now. Uh, we had it back in the 90s and early 2000s, and it was one of the th items that were cut because of the recession, because we didn't have the money. Uh, the program we had before worked very well. Uh, a lot of the times, the students were not cited. They were remanded to the juvenile section, which counseled them, and therefore they had no record. The thing I've heard from all the young people now that were students back then, that it was a very positive uh, program. But the district needs to have veto over who those officers are, because they have to be the right people. And it should be the district responsibility to decide who the final choice is in those officers. And if they don't work out, 
then it's up to the board to say we need different officers. Thank you. Mr. Kayangyan, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. It has been reported that the school district is considering bringing back police officers to Vallejo's two high school campuses. What policies would you develop to assure a positive relationship between these officers and the students? School resource officers um, are not regular police officers. They're there to be uh, like a law-related counselor and a law-related educator. And and more like be there for the students, not just to arrest them, but be there for them. In addition, um, I would also advocate for uh, hiring more school counselors and psychologists that would like complete um, and address the many issues that our student faces every day, whether it's from home or at school. It's great that it, it, took, a lot, it took a while to get school, that we're getting school resource officers back on campus. That, sh that should have been advocated years ago. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Wilson, you get question number 18. And the question is, you have a minute and a half, and the question is, members of the community have expressed their concern about the time of day and the location of the school board meetings. Do you feel the current meeting time and location are conductive to public participation? Conducive, sorry. To public participation? Why or why not? The school district is currently holding a um, survey we're testing. Um, and we are, we do, during the year, hold school meetings at different times and throughout the community. Based upon that, we will make a determination. I have no problem holding meetings whenever and wherever. We specifically are testing uh, to see which time is most conducive for the community. Also, it's how the agenda is uh, constructed. The lighter weight items can be in, in the front of the agenda. The more heavy ones that require lots of community support are, uh, should be toward the latter part of the agenda. Our teachers are some who liked, who have indicated that they like the earlier schedule. That schedule came into play under the state administrator. We are looking at and we are considering based upon the feedback that we get as to the time. We do throughout the year hold our meetings at different times at different locations throughout the community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ubaldi, would you, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We experimented about two months ago, I believe, to have a later meeting. It was one of our lowest turned out, one of the lowest. But we're still open considering the recommendation. And part of that is that our responsibility is listening. It's very important that we when we develop policies that we hear all the input, all sides of the debate in order for us to be an effective policy maker. I am very open to whatever time that they would need. I feel that one of the things that I've noticed though, and I pointed this out to our board, is that we may not get the right or timely reporting from the newspaper if we meet late because they have a scheduled deadlines. So that was concern that I brought up at one time. But we are open to a possibility of change. Thank you. Ms. Law Miller, you have question number 18. Again, one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? OK. All the community members that I've been talking with for the past few months have said, we need a later meeting time, 7 o'clock. This is a bedroom community. Nobody can get there at 5 o'clock that wants to be involved. 
So I would be in support of moving it back. There's also the matter of uh, communicating if we're going to be switching locations or changing times, making sure that the community is advised well in advance so that they can plan their schedules to attend, either at a different site or different times. I'd also suggest that any celebrations that we have, we have two meetings a month, so the celebratory uh, meeting could happen at the beginning of the month, so it could be a really big celebration, and then the business of the district could happen after that. But then everybody would know in the community that on the first meeting of the month, the kids are going to be recognized or, or positive performances are going to be recognized and make it a bigger deal. Getting more support and more folks involved in the meetings, extremely important, simply because more minds have greater ideas and the more input that we can get, not when it's just a hot button issue, but the day-to-day -day business of doing business, I think that's very important. Anything we can do to increase the participation, we really need to give that serious consideration. Thank you. No. <laughs> Question number 19 goes to you, Mr. Worrell. You have a minute and a half. Okay. Do you feel the school district is adequately transparent to the community? If you do, how is that being done? I'll segue into the last question. No, I do not feel the district is being very transparent. The board meetings are public meetings. That means it's for the public. It's not for the district. It's for the public. And when you hold the meetings at 5 o'clock, that, that excludes a whole lot of people. I've been advocating since the, since the state administrator moved the meetings to 5 o'clock that they need to be at 7 o'clock so more people can go. Uh, when they do hold the meetings at different places and different times, you need to highlight that because I look at it all the time and sometimes I miss it. But if you were to highlight it, if you're going to have it at a different location, it needs to be highlighted, I'm saying like in red. You need to say it's going to be at uh, uh, Elsa Wiedemann School this week. You need to put that highlighted in red. The time, when you change the time. I've only had one 7 o'clock meeting in the last, I don't know how many years. And again, that wasn't highlighted. If you don't look, if, if you're used to just looking at something, you're not going to catch something that's a little bit different, which is the place and the time. That's transparency. To me, if you have the meetings to where people can come to, you are being more transparent. If you're not, why are you not holding, holding the meetings to where the public can come to them? What are you trying to hide? That's my question. If you're not having to where the public, the city, city council meetings are at 7 o'clock. Thank you. Mr. Kayangyang, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? I'm good, thank you. Okay. No, I don't, I don't agree that this school district is transparent, especially when they hold their school board meetings at an inconvenient time, as mentioned, 5 p.m., as a school, when elected as a school board member, I would advocate at the first meeting, we have to change the meeting to 7 p.m. to be closer to the people, more accessible, and more convenient for them. In addition, I would advocate as a board member that we hold our regular meetings, not just special meetings, regular meetings at the school sites, and as Mr. World mentioned, advertise them to the community. That should be policy, board policy. And finally, I would also um, hold office hours with, with the community on a regular basis. I think board members should hold office hours and hear their needs. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, you have one minute. Would you like, to repeat, would like me to repeat the question? Please. Okay. Do you feel the, stu the school district is adequately transparent to the community? If you do, how is that being done? I believe that the school district is being transparent. We have held meetings throughout the community that has been covered. Our meetings are noticed in the newspaper, on the website, letters sent to home to um, our students through our all call system, which contacts every parent, 
in the district. And we were very transparent last night on the issue that was on the uh, budget, on the agenda concerning the Measure A funds. There was, yes, there were expenditures for Measure A, but we recognized that Measure A was not only the $133 million bond, it was the $60 million in addition that we got in matching funds from the state. And so therefore, that $133 million was per the letter of the bond language, the $60 million was for additional expenditures for, fiz Thank for, you. for our facilities Thank you. in addition to the $133 Thank million. You. We were very transparent. Thank, Thank you. you. Question number 20, and the last of this segment of tonight is goes to you, Mr. Obaldi. You have a minute and a half. And the question is, how would you develop policy to implement regular and formal meetings between the school district and city government? I currently serve in the interagency committee that has participation from the planning commission, from GVRD, from the um, uh, City Hall, from the library, from uh, what else? Um, several other groups. And we meet monthly. And we share in a particular agenda items that it has, is developing within the city. So we are doing that now, and the school district is very present. And our staff is also present when that happens. So when we develop policy, we share concerns like the, the, the uh, school bond, and that bond that we did with GVRD, the bond that was done with the library. We share all those concerns because we are all part of the community. So we are very intentional about meeting once a month to share the information that we need. And so we're very, very grateful for that model, and perhaps it's one of, one of the few in a community. So it is happening. And it's very, very effective. Thank you. And also, we have, yeah, we've had one joint meeting with the council, the city council, also. I know, but I thought he was stopping. OK, Ms. Longmiller, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Thank you. I, I was very excited to see that the city and the district was getting together and sitting down in a public meeting um, for the first time. That was historic. I would suggest that we do that at least quarterly. I'm glad to hear that there's other commissions that are meeting with the district. I know we will have arrived when I stop hearing the district's really hard to do business with or the city's really tough to work with. Once those dialogues change, then we know we will have arrived. But that's going to take time to build those relationships. And you can't do it over the phone, and you can't do it in public forums like this. It's actually sitting down and building the trust that you need amongst all the officials that are going to guide us through the things that we're going through as a city. This is a community-wide effort. Our economic development hinges on the success of our school district. We all know that. But we can't do it as long as we're operating in silos. So let's, take, let's continue to break down those walls, continue to speak with each other in a respectful, civil way, and come up with solutions that work for everybody. If we focus on win-win, all the way across, Thank you. then we'll do better. Thank you very much. Mr. Worrell, you have one minute. Would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, no, thank you. OK. <clears throat> there seems to be a misunderstanding out there that uh, the city and the schools can get together and do all kinds of different things. It's just not true. They're two different, separate entities. However, with that said, there still needs to be joint meetings between the school district the school board and the city council, uh, either semi-annually or annually, to work on problems that they both have that they can work on together. Uh, the most you can do is joint power agreements. If you come up with ideas on what will work with both the city and the school district, then you can do something that way. I, a lot of times when you hear districts get into problems, uh, I know in the past when Vallejo was in the problem, you know, they talked about, well, we can have the city take it over 
or the governor talks about every once in a while having a, a district takeover. It does not work that way. The school district and the city are two separate entities, but they can still meet and talk about their mutual problems that they can solve together. Thank you. Thank you. We now go to the second part of this evening, which is um, questions from the audience. We have five questions, so each one of you will get a question. And I was going to pick the question, but I think it'd be fair enough to actually let you pick your own question. Then nobody's responsible except you. <laughs> no. <laughs> OK, Mr. Kayanyan gets first. And may I read it? Thank you. OK. So, Mr. Kayanyan, you have a minute to answer this question. And the question is, how much money in grants has the superintendent personally brought through her efforts to Vallejo City Unified School District? Do you view this as an asset? When I attended uh, one of the school board meetings um, this year, uh, I remember a presentation where we were receiving between 10 and $20 million of grants for the upcoming school year. That would uh, fund the various programs that the district currently offers. However, I feel that we need new school board members that are going to be responsible for overseeing the millions of dollars we're receiving, not just from, um, not just from grants, but also new funding from whatever revenue source we receive. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Ms. Wilson, you're next. Okay. Do you want to do it? Right. And then, okay. So, Ms. Wilson, you have one minute, and the question is, sorry. in 2009, the district API was 715. In 2013, it was 716. Huh. It's a bit difficult to read in some ways. I, Can I just a one-point improvement. How do you, how do this factor into your claims of improvement? Okay. Do you want me to try that again? I think I can do it a bit better second time around. I'll try and work with that. Okay. And that was in 2009? 2009, the API was 715, and 2013, it was 716. In 2009, the state administrator was here. In 2013, is that was correct? Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Bishop had brought in our programs, our new programs. As you know, API no longer exists. As you know, API no longer exists. We're under smart balance measures. We field tested in 2014. In the spring of 2014, smart balance measures. So API no longer exists. So, you're com so you will be comparing apples and oranges if you are looking at API <laughs> under two different administrations. We will see once we have got into the new testing process, the benefits Thank of you. our programs. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Ubaldi, you have one minute, and the question is, Tell me your position on Common Core. Common Core is a national policy. It's not a local district policy, per se, a state policy. And it is there to help kids to be prepared for the future challenges. 
reading and writing is so critical. Technology is another issue that has been added because we need to be updated and to be prepared for the workforce challenge that is emerging in our community. I am very supportive of Common Core because it keeps everyone on a playing field. It helps those who are not quite there yet and it offers them greater time to understand the challenges of the workforce development that we're preparing them. Thank you. But that was a good try. Oh, thank you. See, you got me confused. If on the board, you have one minute. If on the board, how would you vote yes or no and why regarding changing the Vallejo High School Apache mascot? Whoa, I think that's already been decided. <laughs> After having watched that, that whole issue come up and how it was resolved, um, it was very concerning. That's, that's, it's, it's historical. People have a lot of emotion invested in it. But I believe it was the right thing to do. In order to fully honor our diversity, we have to be very, very sensitive to the history, but also the facts of our history. And it has not been pretty. So I think it was the right decision. It was very, very emotional. But I would have voted yes to make the change. Thank you. Mr. Worrell, would you like to pick this? <laughs> Thank you. OK. OK. How would you, you read this? I'll read it. What does he think of instruments? Okay, okay. What do you think of instruments? Instrumental music in schools. I'm sorry? What do you think of instrumental music in schools? I think, I think we need it. Uh, kids don't come to school just to learn. Kids come to school for a variety of different reasons. Uh, some of them come for the sports, some come for all kinds of activities. We need to have as many as possible different activities, not just, not just instrumental. We need to implement more. A lot's been taken away when some of us here were going to school. There's a lot more different programs that you could uh, uh, participate in. Uh, I'm supportive of it. If we can find the money to get it, I'm, I'm there with it. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> OK. Okay, we have closing statements now, which is part three of our program tonight. And we will start with Mr. Kayang Yang. You have a minute and a half to say anything you want. <laughs> well, first I wanna thank you for coming out here and sharing um, and hearing our ideas of how we're gonna tackle the issues facing our schools. I wanna thank my fellow candidates for sharing their platform as well. I also wanna thank uh, Citizens for Vallejo for organizing this helpful forum to inform the people of how, what needs to happen. Having, having lived in Vallejo for almost 25 years, I was raised by a hardworking single mother. She taught me the value of public education. Having attended Vallejo Public Schools, Community College, and UC Berkeley, I have personal experience of what needs to happen. We have, we have serious issues that our schools face. As a former college board student trustee, city commissioner, public education advocate, and education policy consultant, I'm here to help fix our schools. We have students and teachers being assaulted, a high dropout rate, and bullying, all documented by not one, not two, but three Solano County grand jury reports. We have low teacher morale and flattening test scores. Fairfield School District and Compton School District, they're, they're exceeding us. These issues existed when I was a student years ago. My younger brother, who graduated in the top 20% of his class, and he was in one of those academ academies that the school, 
School District Salton, he'll tell you the issues are, much, are getting worse. But I'm here to help alleviate those issues. I'm here to advocate for you, but I can't do it alone. I need your help. I need your vote to make a change on the school board. Thank I'm you. your candidate. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, you have a minute and a half. This forum was billed as the success of a city depends on the quality of its schools. And school board trustees guide that quality. We need trustees who will transform our mediocre schools into high-performing institutions that guarantee a future for all of our youth. How do you define mediocre? Over $12 million in grant money brought, brought to the district. Steady decrease in the dropout rate. K-12 science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics programs. What did the state superintendent of schools, Tom Torlakson, say? Implementation of restorative justice and positive behavior interventions over the last several years has made a tremendous impact on the safety in the Vallejo City Unified School District. What did a local member of the Solano County Board of Supervisors say about our academic programs? Vallejo City Unified School District academics provide our students with the educational foundation that will last them a lifetime. I am the president of the Vallejo, uh, of the Solano County Com uh, School Boards Association. The other school board recognize the tremendous work that we're doing. Benicia says we're well ahead of them in the Thank academies. You. Thank you. The Fairfield Board Thank you, says Wilson. we have restorative justice Ms. and Wilson. how can we get Thank it? you. Thank you. Mr. Ubaldi. Thank you. I'll wait until everyone goes silent again. Hold on. Thank you, Mr. Ubaldi. You have a minute and a half. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I hope it is obvious to everyone that the current board and it is not a do-nothing board. The records speak for itself. We have raised the attendance and enrollment of student body. We have reduced dropout rate. We have also reduced the achievement gap and we're graduating more students. We have also reduced our expulsion rate. Likewise, we have created 21st century curriculum that is rigorous and relevant to the future needs of our modern society. Wall-to-wall -wall academies meet the interests of our diverse student body. Full community service community schools to address the comprehensive academic, social, and physical education services to our students and their families. And finally, creating a positive school cultures that offer the best intervention approach toward the safety of our students by implementing positive behavior intervention, support, restorative justice, and trauma-informed care. As a retired professional, I am able to give more time developing policies and programs, but most importantly, visiting and attending many meetings and conferences in our schools. This is a priority which I have given our school district for three years. I will, rem I will maintain this dedication and commitment. Let us move forward with stability. I respectfully request your support. Vote for me November 4th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Longmiller, you have one minute and a half. Thank you so much for being so attentive this evening. I know this is a very, very important election that we're coming up on. My 30 years of corporate experience in HR and team building provides me a level of hands-on experience that I think will provide an infusion of new leadership and ideas on this board. We have made steady progress, but no one no one in this room, I think, can say they're happy with where we're at today. We're getting there. It's a long road ahead of us. As a retired individual, again, I have the time, the passion, and the heart that it takes to go the long distance that we have left. I have partnerships throughout the community, having been on the board of Loma Vista Farm, 
appointed to a city commission for the participatory budgeting process. I currently sit on the board of the Boys and Girls Club. I'm in touch with the kids weekly at the farm and throughout the community in the other garden areas. We see the lights come on when they're given the opportunity to learn where they're at. I would like to be able to participate in that at a greater level as a member of your 2014 school board. I'm Shelley Lockmiller. I would really appreciate your support and your vote on November 4th. Thank you. Okay, you have a minute and a half. Thank you. Uh, I've grown up in this community, stayed here, uh, even all of my other relatives left uh, because I like this community. I was a police officer here for 30 years. I understand what an education means. Uh, we've heard a lot tonight about the new restorative justice program, yet we already have a program in place, the Willie B. Atkins Project, which works on the other end to keep the students, the young people, out of the criminal justice system and be productive citizens. That's the type of program we need to put more money into. It has a very positive effect, not only on the schools, but on this community as well. As I said, I served on, this, on the school board for eight years. When I was no longer there, I didn't just right off into the sunset. I still go to the meetings. I've been to probably 95% of the meetings of the school district in the last 20 years. This isn't some passion I've just come up with. It's something that is a part of me. I hope you will vote for me so I can work as a board member again. But even if I don't win the election, I will still be at the meetings because I care about this community. I care about the students. I want to see us have a safe, productive community. And to do that, we need to have the best school system we can have in this city. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your patience. And um, please, mingle. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you.